this morning. It's exciting to be back in the house of the Lord, back home. Uh, it's been a very, very active and, and busy s- summer for your pastor. How many of you still love me? Good, I'm glad, because I love you guys so much. And it's been such a busy, busy time this summer. It's probably been one of, one of the busiest summers that I have had in a long time. I was with Pastor Sonny and Julie uh, just two days ago. They came down, and I was just sharing with them. I said, man, Pastor, we've just, we just been so busy, so active in the vision. Last Sunday, we were in Riverside with Pastor Dell and also the Inland Empire region. All the churches came together and just totally packed that place out to overflow. And uh, it was a powerful time there in Riverside. Because how many know people are hungry? How many of you came to church hungry this morning, right? They're hungry. Hungry for the vision. Hungry for leadership. That's what the world needs. How many know the world is in need of strong leadership? And so they were hungry. We had a great time there. But it's just also been so busy uh, with a lot of transition. Georgina and I are getting ready to move into a new home next week. And then also our uh, dis- women's discipleship home. That they're, they're moving into a new home. And then we had some good news also this week. We, we've been, we, we saw this house many years ago that we've been praying for. Many years ago that we've been praying for. And uh, just recently the doors opened. And uh, we met with the owner, and she came to us. She says, I have a property I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you guys to take over. And uh, it's a one-acre property right here in the city, one-acre property. And this week, we were able to secure that. And I believe that God wants to do some great things on that one-acre property. And the first thing I believe God wants to do is God wants to put our women's home there. Amen. And... You know, they, they've been struggling with an, an exorbitant rent, a, a high rent in their facility, too heavy for them, that even the cafe couldn't meet that need. So we said, you know, we got to find something that's going to meet their need, and uh, but still they'll be able to afford financially. And so sure enough, not only did God bless us with this property, but the rent is substantially lower. Lower. And, you know, me and Georgina, we're visionaries, so we're not just only thinking about one ministry. We're also thinking about the movement. And hasn't it been exciting to see some of the missionaries that come in for training from all over the world? How many get proud when you see Arnold and Queen doing so well? How many get excited when you see Joanne stepping out here? This girl's changed. She's a minister. Amen. Amen. And she's stepping out, using her gifts. Well, I'm getting phone calls from all over the world, guys. People that want to come to our church and want to be a part of what God is doing here in San Diego. In fact, we have a couple that is here this morning. They're they're, they're coming in all the way from Atlanta. They want to make this their home church. I have, praise the Lord, we have uh, Dr. Jim. How many heard him preach last week? Dr. Jim and Anna and Misha. This is now their home church. I have another group of young people that are coming in from Northern California that want to say, you know what, we want some training. So we're coming to San Diego. I got another young man that I'm going to be meeting with next month coming all the way from Mexico City. Come on, somebody. I mean, something's happening right here. Something's happening in your midst. Never look over what God is doing. Always be aware of what God is doing. How many can say amen? So when I look at that property, I say, you know what, that would be a good place also to put some of our missionaries in training. Missionaries in training. We have the UTC. We also have, oh man, we have three graduates getting ready to come back from the UTC. Victoria's back as well. So, how many know we got to make room? Tell your neighbor, we got to make room. And and I can foresee, this is what I can foresee. Is this interesting to you? I can foresee even more missionaries and couples coming in from training for training from literally all over the world. How many think that's part of the calling God's placed on Victor Arch San Diego? Come on, somebody. You never know what God's going to do. Nicole's here this morning, and she's on break. She's a teacher, and she's teaching in China. And she's a member of our church. I know one day God's going to give her a soul over there in China. I think one day she's going to come back from break and have a little Chinese girl with her. That she's discipling. How many think that is possible? Amen. 
How many know that's what we're called to do? Preach the gospel, spread the vision around the world. And so I could foresee that acreage uh, being a place. Uh, the lady said, uh, we want to give it to you for one year. And so, you know, Pastor Al, I'm thinking far ahead. And uh, we went, walked the property, and it was, it, it's in bad condition. It needs a lot of work. I said, you know, I thank you for that generous offer, but, you know, one year is not enough for us. Just to get it up to our standard it'll, it might take a few months, and we wouldn't have much time. I said, and I went with the boldness. Come on, somebody. I said, would you consider giving it to us for five years? And she says, I would think about that. I said, would you think about this? I saw an open door. I had to go through it. I said, would you think about giving it to us for 10 years? She says, you know what? My son wants me to sell it and to turn it into apartments. She says, but I know that God gave me this property to use it for the ministry. Come on, somebody. I said, oh, praise the Lord. So I said, would you consider this? That not only we lease it for 10 years, but if anything were ever to happen to you or your family, that you would give us first right of refusal so that we could have the first opportunity out of everybody to buy it, to make sure it doesn't turn into apartments, but that Victor Arich San Diego owns it. Come on, somebody. How many know that God has given us a vision? So we got the keys. We got the keys. And it is exciting. It is exciting. I, I see expansion taking place. How many feel it? And that's why I want you to continue to be faithful. Can you look over at your neighbor and tell them, thank you for your faithfulness? Because how many know we can't expand with people who aren't rooted? And we've also, I know you're looking at me and saying, oh, I, there's something else going on you're not know, talking about. Well, the, the expansion of the sanctuary. Oh, my God. I think I've been working on that the most. Pastor Miller and myself and Paul, we've been going nuts. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of stuff. But we're grateful that we're making headway. And by September 1st, we'll be able to give you a first schematic drawing of what we're going to do in the brand new Victory Outreach San Diego Sanctuary. Oh, I, you, got, you ought to get more excited about it. I, I tell you, it's awesome. Praise the Lord. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn with me to the book of Philippians. Thank you, guys. Philippians chapter 3. Also, my wife will be in the next service. She was ministering in San Jose, and uh, they took uh, some girls up there, and I heard God move greatly. Philippians chapter 3. I really, I want to I read the whole thing. Is that all right? Verse 7. It says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God by faith. Now, here's the part I really want you to tune into. This is Paul, and he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Verse 12, he says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfect. Is there, are there any perfect people out there? Mm -mm, don't raise your hand now. He says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected. Look at here. He says, but I press on. But I press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do. Watch this. Forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching. Some versions say straining for those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize, look at this, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
How many love that scripture? And how many believe with your pastor this morning that Paul the Apostle had the will to win? Do you got the will to win? How many want to win in this thing? Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, give your neighbor a high five and just tell them you are a winner this morning. Mm -hmm. I want to continue on the subject of the will to win, the will to win. And this morning, I want to talk to you about why winners win, why winners win. Win. How many? How many just feel in your spirit that if you're going to serve God, you you got to win in this thing. We're, we're not called to be defeated. We're called to win. And and if you have an interest in a mindset of victory in your life, you might ask the question: What's the difference between someone who wins and someone who you know loses or, or suffers loss in their life? It's very simple. A winner is someone who made a decision to win. That's why I asked the question, if you want to be a winner, do you desire to be a winner? Because in order to win in this thing called Christianity, you must make a decision. Because a winner decides to win. While a person who loses, watch this, fails to decide. Lives a life of indecision. Lives a life of in the middle of uncertainty. So a person who actually wins is someone who simply made the decision to win, and someone who loses fails to make critical decisions within their life. I meet so many people, you, you do too, who spend so many hours praying. How many know that person? They're constantly praying. You say, what are you doing? I'm praying. What are you doing about it? I'm praying. How are you going to change the situation? I'm praying. Come on, somebody. They're, 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 you know, that's like the, a thing we say as Christians. You know, I, I'm just praying about the situation, Pastor. I talk to so many people who spend so many hours in prayer, but when they get up from the prayer, they fail to decide to move on what they've been praying about. So how many know you can pray? But if you want to win, you must eventually make a decision to move in the direction of your prayer. Here's what I want to say to my church this morning about victory. How many desire to walk in victory? Well, in order to walk in victory, let's understand that victory is not a special favor from God. Sometimes we see people who walk in victory say, oh, man, they, they, they got a special anointing. They got a special favor. Isn't that how Christians talk? They've got a special a favor on their life, and there, there must be something special about them and something special for them. I'm not here to take that away from them, but what I am telling you is that victory or winning is not a special favor from God. It's not a special anointing. It's nothing like that. Victory is simply a, a decision that every winner must make. It's when a person, it's when a child of God decides, watch this, to hold on to God's purpose for their life. It's when a child of God decides, someone say decide, because you've got to decide that no matter what you're going through, you're not going to let go of God's purpose for your life. It's when a person decides to improve in some form or fashion. It's when a person decides to move past, watch this, when a person decides to move past, watch this, or even sometimes through the obstacles who decides to move past, or sometimes, how many of you got to move through the obstacle? Move through the obstacles that inevitably rise up to try to hinder God's destiny and dream and vision within a person's life. If you've got a vision this morning, if you have a dream this morning, if you believe that God has given you a special word, know that there will be obstacles that will eventually try to rise up against you, but you've got to decide that you're going to move past it or you're going to move through it if necessary. Why? Because you are a winner. Tell your neighbor, you're a winner. See, why do I preach this to you this morning? Because many people stop at failure. Some even stop simply at the obstacle. See, they want to win. But failure has stopped them. Or when they see the obstacles or the storms begin to arise, it causes them to stop. I came to tell you this morning, there are two types of people. There are those who achieve God's given vision and everyone else. Is there anyone here this morning that you say, I'm going to achieve God's vision in my life? 
No matter what the devil throws at me. No matter what doubts begin to rise up in my spirit, no matter what critics say, come on, somebody, nothing's going to take me away from my purpose. Nothing's going to take me away from God's calling and God's plan for my life. See, failure, watch this, and opposition is an an inevitable experience in the Christian life. Eventually, you're going to experience some failure. And, And every single one of us knows what it is to have some particular obstacles that rise up. Someone said that adversity always dogs the trail of success. And, and I want to tell you this morning, we all, we all fail at things. We all fail. Okay? Don't look at me like that. Some of y'all failed last night. Hey, come on, somebody. No, I'm just playing. We all fail. Come on, let's get loosened up a little here. We all fail at things. We all make mistakes. We all stumble at times. We don't always make the right decision. Are there any real people in church this morning? We all fail. We all make mistakes. And and here's what I want to tell you is that on your journey to success, you will continue to fail. You will continue to slip. You will continue to make bad decisions within your within your life. But I want to tell you when you make a a bad decision or you fail, God hasn't called you to stay stuck in the failure. He hasn't called you to stay stuck in the bad decision. He wants you to take that poor decision, and he wants you to learn from it. Oh, come on now. That's good preaching. He wants you to learn from it. Uh, Thomas Edison, the great inventor, said, I, have, I haven't failed. I've never failed. I've learned 1,000 ways not to do a thing. Come on now. And this is a man. Watch this. This is a man that, that, that changed the world through his ideas. This is a man who, who invented the light bulb. Come on, somebody. This is a man who invented the, you know, the AC electrical flow that we use to this day. This is a man who built factories and, and helped to build the railroads and all these things. And he made mistakes, but he changed the world because he didn't quit. He didn't quit on his vision. He didn't quit on, on, on what God was showing him. Come on, somebody, clap for the Lord. So you, you're going to have some failure. You're going to have some failure. Let, let me teach you this. That failure can be a powerful tool within your life. But it depends on how you use it. Failure can be a, a powerful tool in your life, but it depends on how you use it. It can be used to discourage you or it can be used to fuel your vision and fuel your passion. Now, if you, if you have a tendency to quit at everything, you're probably going to stay discouraged. But if you have a tendency to rise in the power of God, to rise because you know that you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you're not going to let failure and opposition discourage you. You're going to say, I must be doing something right. I must be on my way to victory. That's why the enemy keeps coming against me. That's why obstacles keep rising against me because I'm on the right track this morning and I might have made a mistake, but I'm not going to stay. Stay down. Come on, help me preach this morning. I'm going to get back up on my feet, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to try again, and I'm going to keep on fighting, and I'm going to keep on. I feel the anointing right now. And I'm going to keep on pressing, and I'm going to press like Paul pressed, and I'm not going to give up. Let them stone me. Let them talk about me. Let them come against me. I'm going to press on. 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 You see? You've got to use failure to fuel your vision and passion because failure will either birth an inspiration or a desperation in your life. Now, here's something that I have learned and I want to pass on to you. Here's something I've learned in my life is that you'll never be listed as a failure when you're the first to do something. Mm. You'll You'll never be listed as a failure. It might take you a thousand tries, but when you're the first one to break through, they'll forget the thousand failures. (laughs) You might have failed a hundred times, but they'll forget it when you begin to break through. See, when winners overcome failure, what happens? Failure breaks barriers for others. Winning is the cure. All right? I'm in a big old fight, but winning is a cure. Win- winning is the cure. A- and when you begin to break through those barriers in your life, what happens? You break barriers for others. This is so key. This is why you can't give up. I want to talk to you for a moment about a famous runner by the name of Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister was the first to run a four-minute mile. On May 6, 1954, he busted through 
the four minute mile barrier with a time of three minutes and 59 and four tenths of a second. He barely broke it. What's significant about this record is that at that time, track and field was the premier sport. It's not like today, NFL, MLB, NBA. They didn't have any of that back then. They had track and field. And so they would pack out stadiums to see these runners uh, do these human feats. And they had been chasing the goal seriously since at least 1886. And that challenge involved the most brilliant coaches and gifted athletes in North America, Europe, and Australia. And for years, for years, for decades, runners strove to strove against the clock to break that record. But the elusive four minutes had always beaten them. What had happened, it had become as much a psychological barrier than a physical barrier. Mm, think about winning. It was a psychological barrier more than a physical barrier. And like any unconquerable mountain, the closer it approached, the closer they got to it, the more daunting it seemed. The closer they got to breaking it, the harder it seemed that they could break it. It seemed impossible that they would never break the four-minute mile. The four-minute mile at that time was considered the holy grail of athletic achievement. And it could not be broken even by the greatest athletic minds. Now, Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, and he did it having no coach, no team, but he set out to break the record. Most experts who studied the record predicted that it could only be broken on a perfect day of 68 degrees, that it only could be broken by running on a hard clay surface, and it would only be broken in front of a huge boisterous cloud, crowd of thousands of people that would cheer the runner and encourage the runner in order to motivate the runner to break the mile. But when Bannister broke it, it was a cold day on a wet track in front of a small group of people. Come on, somebody. He broke the record. He defied the odds. This is preaching. He broke the record. They said it has to be done this way. It can only be done this way. If you're going to break it, this is the only way it's going to get done. But Roger Bannister broke the record his way. Can I hear an amen? And we need some people here this morning that aren't going to get wrapped up in all the talk. You're not going to get wrapped up in all the opposition. You're not going to get wrapped up in all the impossibilities. We need some people here that can hear from God about their vision and recognize that if God be for you, he's with you. And who could be against you? I can't to tell you this morning, you are a record breaker this morning. When he broke the record, watch what happened. Every critic breathed a sigh of relief because this record literally took over 70 years to break. 70 years. 70 years of trying to break this record. 70 years of strategizing and planning on how to break this record of the four-minute mile. Watch what happened. When Roger Bannister broke the record, just 46 days later, another runner rose up to break the record by one second. It took him 70 years. But once he broke it, whoo, this is good. Once he broke it, just 46 days later, someone beat his record. And then... One year later, just one year later, after 70 years, one man broke it. And then one year later, three runners broke the record in the same track meet. Come on, somebody. What am I trying to tell you this morning? You can't quit. You can't throw in the towel. I know you're tired. I know you're frustrated. I know you say, hey, when is my breakthrough going to come? But you can't quit because when you break through, your family's going to break through. When you break through, your spouse is going to break through. When you break through, your, 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 come on, people following you are going to break through. Come on, keep on pressing. Keep on pushing. Don't throw in the towel. The best is yet to come. Don't throw in the towel. You're going to break the record. And then once he, they broke it, 1,000 runners broke it after that. Was it 
watch this, was it a sudden growth spurt? What, what caused it to happen? What caused it to happen? You know, the, the experts are always trying to figure everything out. Well, we, we're smart, so we got to figure it out. I think people like that are actually just dumb. I think people are just trying to figure everything out are actually stupid. I think the smart people are the people that go by faith. I think the smart people are the people that have the spirit of God in their life. So all the smart people said, well, how, how, did, it, how did it break it? What, you know, was, it um, was there a sudden growth spurt in human evolution? Over the last 10 years, you know, we believe in evolution, so somehow the bone structure and the lungs got bigger and somehow just something evolved. Was there a genetic engineering experience that created a new race of super runners? It was none of that. When Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, he changed the mentality of any, every runner that followed him. He became the new model. He became not the new running model. Watch this. He became the new mental model. Oh, man. I, some of you are just sleeping on me. Come on, somebody. You, you know what you're going to become? You're not going to become the new physical model. You're going to be the new spiritual model. You're, you're going to be the new mental model. You're going to walk not in the old mentality. You're going to walk in the new mentality. He broke the model. He broke the mentality because every runner of the past had been held back by a mindset that said it could not be done, that nobody could ever break the four-minute mile. But when that limit was broken, others saw that what seemed impossible was now possible. Isn't that what they said about you and I? Didn't they say we couldn't change? Didn't they say we would never get set free? Didn't they say we'd be losers all our entire life? But didn't Jesus come in and break the record? And aren't you still breaking records? And aren't you still going to a now? Come on and help me this morning. Is it real in your life? Do you got a new mentality? Woo! Touch your neighbor and tell him you're a record breaker. See, what do winners do? They overcome failure. They overcome defeat. They overcome setbacks. They overcome people who try to talk them out of their dream. Try to talk them out of their vision. Try to talk them out of their destiny. But when you are a winner and you're a record breaker, you recognize that I cannot be talked out of my destiny. I can't be pulled away from God's plan in my life. Come on, clap for the Lord. I, I cannot. I, I've, got, I've got a reason to run. I don't run without aim. I don't run without purpose. I got a vision from God, and I'm going to run. No matter what the enemy throws at me, I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I need some runners up in here. I need some people that are going to run no matter what they say about you. Hey. Don't let anybody talk down your dream. So let's talk real quick. I'm almost done. Why do winners win? Write this down. Why? That was powerful, wasn't it? Why do winners win? Number one, they know the plan. They know the plan. They know that God has a plan. And I think we must be reminded of that sometimes. You say, man, why am I here? Why am I coming to church? Because God has a plan. It's important to know that there's a divine plan and purpose for your life. It's important to know that when, when Jesus saved you and God created you, he didn't just throw you together and send you on your way. He, he, he filled you with the plan. The Bible says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible's clear, right, that you've been transformed by the renewing of your mind, that everything that's in you was not just thrown there, it was placed there. There is a plan. Say, there is a plan. The plan is for you. The plan is for your marriage. The plan is for your family. And God put that plan together. See, what causes people to stop running and what causes people to stop fighting for their vision and fighting for their dream is they don't learn the difference between the why and the what. The why and the what. For anyone to win, they must have a powerful why. For anyone to win, they, they must have a powerful why. Some of you have a why that was birthed out of inspiration. Others of you have a why that was birthed out of desperation. Last time I spoke to you, I talked to you about how I have a why that has been birthed out of desperation. And so what is the what? what? What is the what? The what, watch this, has to do with the things that you are experiencing in your life right now. The things that you are going through in your life right now is the what. 
You might be going through something you don't like right now. You might be in a, in a season or a circumstance right now. You say, I don't like it. It doesn't feel good to be here. I'm not on the mountaintop. I'm in the valley. That is your what? That is what is happening to you right now. You might be in that season of testing. You might be working a job that you do not like. I don't like this job. I hate going to this job. I get up in the morning. I hate going. I hate being there. I hate the people that work there. I can't stand in this environment. It, it stinks. It's horrible. It doesn't make me happy. I can't wait to get off so I could just go to church. <laughs> I don't like it. Remember last week when I told you that you have to learn to master the little things. You have to master the little things because it's the little things that lead to the big opportunities. So that's your what. Say, that's my what. You might be in transition. You might be in a situation or a ministry right now where you feel like you're not breaking through to the place that God has called you to be or doing the things that God has called you to do. But here's what I want to say to you this morning. Never allow your what to move you away from your why. I know what it feels like, church, to wake up one morning and to say, what in the world is happening in my life? Have you ever done it? What is that? Who is that? What in the world is that? I know what it is to wake up in San Diego and feel like I'm in a foreign territory because my what is so off. My what is just so weird right now. I'm just in a weird what. Come on now. So I know what it is to wake up and, 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 and see that my world has shifted. Has that ever happened to you? And you're going to go through things in your life where you feel like your world from one day to another has just shifted. But understand me, it's just a what? It's just a what? It Don't let that what season pull you away from your why. Because your why is your destiny. Your why is where you're going. Your why is the plan. He says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of good and not of evil. Plans to give you a future. Plans to give you a hope. Don't let your why, your what, pull you out of your why. Ooh, this is powerful stuff. See, Paul said this. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. He says, not that I've already attained all this or been made perfect, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining for what is ahead. When you're in a what season, you got to keep on straining. When you're in a what season, you got to keep on pressing. You know what I believe God allows what seasons to do in our life? I believe that God will allow a what season so that you, be, you, you begin to fall in love with your why again. Come on, somebody, because you got some Christians in the house of God that you've been cheating on your why. You've been cheating on yourself. You've been cheating on your destiny. You forgot. Oh, man. Pull back. Pull me back, Holy Ghost. See, God is a jealous God. How many know God is a jealous God? He says, don't put any gods before me. He says, I am a jealous God. But the one thing that God will allow you to be intimate with is the destiny he placed in your life. Come on. He says to know. Someone say to know. To know. Say, say to know. The word to know in the original language means to be intimate with. To be intimate with. In other words, married people are intimate as you're intimate with your spouse and you're intimate and, and there's an intimacy there. God uses the same word for you and I to be intimate with him and to be intimate with his plans. God says, if you'll go intimate with my purpose, you're going to be everything that I've called you to be. Come on, somebody. Don't let your what pull you out of your why. Go ahead and be intimate with his plan for your life. What's the second thing that winners do to win? They grow through preparation. They grow through preparation. I've been studying this whole concept of winning, and, and I've been finding out that winning doesn't just happen. All right? Look at your name and tell them, winning just doesn't, doesn't just happen. <laughs> doesn't just happen. If you win without preparation, you just got lucky. If you win without preparation, 
You just got lucky. And there are some lucky people out there. But don't get it twisted. God hasn't called you to be lucky. He's called you to win through preparation. I was watching boxing last night. Woo. Man, I love boxing. And those fighters, they prepare for months before they step into that ring. If they were to step into that ring without any preparation, you know they're not going to win unless they get lucky. Winners prepare. Meaning this, winners welcome growth seasons into their life. Winners welcome growth seasons. I know some Christians that whenever it's a growth season, they close the door. Ooh, I don't want to see you. I'm perfect. You need to change. When a growth season comes, and, and let me know, he's the God of all seasons. And he brings that season in. I know some Christians that instead of welcoming him in, they close the door, they batten down the hatches, they close the mini blinds, they don't come out the bed, they stop coming to church. Hey! But winners prepare. And to prepare is to, is to grow and to welcome in a season of growth in your life. You see, preparation doesn't always feel good. You're going to go through a season of preparation that is going to be uncomfortable. But people who win understand that the purpose of preparation is to grow and change someone for the good. That whenever God allows a season of growth to come into your life, he does it so that you will change. Okay? That you will change. You say, oh, my God. What are you saying, Pastor Al? I have to change? I'm saying, oh, baby. You're overdue on change. <laughs> God tried to come last season. You didn't change. That's why the harder storms are coming. You, you got to change. We all got to change. We all have to grow. We all have to improve. We're all striving. Paul says that I may know him in the power of, and, uh, of his resurrection. Look at this. And in the fellowship of his sufferings. Man, if you ever felt like your trials are hard, look at the cross. Look at what Jesus went through to prepare a way for you and I to have eternal life. The Bible says you have not yet even strived against blood, against sin. Can I hear an amen? But Jesus went the full way. He went all the way to Calvary and he shed his blood for you and I so that we can make our way and have victory. You're going to have a season of growth and preparation because anything that doesn't change seems odd under God's growth. God's order. Anything that doesn't change seems odd under God's order. If you see a tree that should be blooming in season and it's dead, you know there's something wrong with that tree. And there are Christians in the house of God sometimes that they should be growing, but they're not growing. Why? Because they're resisting. A see, you don't want this. You want me to go back to Roger Bannister? See, because you got to prepare. And sometimes there's Christians in the house of God that everybody's growing, but you're stuck. Because maybe you've closed the door on change. You've closed the door on preparation. You see, here's what I believe with all my heart is that tough seasons are preparation seasons. And here's what I've learned, and I want you to write this down or do all you can to remember this statement. Is that he who prepares today, he who prepares today leads inspires, builds, and impacts tomorrow. He who prepares today leads, inspires, builds, and impacts tomorrow. Oh, man, uh, God, don't you know there's a tomorrow? Don't you know that there's a tomorrow? Don't you know that there's a, a, a future? Don't you know that there's a work to be done? Not today, but there's a work to be done tomorrow. Don't you know that there's going to come a time where leaders are needed and parents are needed and men and women of God are needed and strong voices are needed. And when you don't go through the season of preparation, God can't use you in the future. But we are a church that's preparing because we know that there's a future, not only a future here in this church, but there's a future in the ministry of Victory Outreach. And God is looking for those leaders that are willing to prepare right now and get yourself ready right now and to let 
let God bring the changes he needs to bring. See, I know you look at my life and you say, oh, pastor, you got it all together. You might think I've arrived. You might think that I've arrived. You might look at me and say, oh, look at this man of God. He's been serving God all these years and he's arrived. You look at some of the men of God here and you say, oh, man, look at them. They, they raise children. They have homes. They do all these things. And they have arrived. But I came to tell you, we have not arrived. I came to tell you, we have not arrived. We are not everything that God has called us to be as of yet. Why do we still prepare? Why do we still preach this way? Why do we still impart God's word to you? Why do we still work hard? I know there's somebody, you know, that you might look at me and say, man, Pastor God, take a rest. You, you should rest. Why don't you sit back and enjoy some of the fruit of your labor? You've been in ministry 25 years. You've built the training centers. You came here to San Diego, been here, senior pastor for 10 years, six years as an apprentice under the greatest man of God our ministry has ever seen. And you've worked hard. And now go ahead and rest and go ahead and relax. Why don't you just go on vacation? Why don't you just go ahead and just take it easy? Why don't you play some more golf or take it easy? Don't you understand that I can't rest? I can't rest because I know this. If I rest, I die. If I rest, I die. If I take it easy, I die. First, I'll die spiritually, and then I'll die physically. Why do I have to keep preparing? Because I recognize that I still got a work to do. I still got a future. You still have a future. We're not, we haven't seen everything God wants to do yet. But God is looking for some people this morning that say, I'm ready for God to prepare me. I'm ready for God to do that work in my life because there is a future. There is a future. There's three ways you can grow. Number one. You've got to take responsibility for your life. You, you've, got to, you've got to recognize that it's on you. Put your hand on your heart and say, it's on me. And when you put that hand on your heart, I want you to also say, I've got potential. You, you've got potential to lead. You've got potential to break barriers. You've got potential to do great things within your life. You've got potential to make an impact. You've got potential to do some good in this world. Don't give up on your potential. Take responsibility for your life. You know what I want to say to some of you? Stop making excuses. Well, you know, my upbringing. And oh, well, and I went through this. And I had to go. No, no, no. No more excuses. It's a new season. It's a season of preparation in your life. You have great potential. The second thing to grow is treat yourself as your greatest inve investment. Treat yourself as your greatest investment. Strive to expand. Strive to expand. Don't settle. Don't settle where you are. If we settle, we die. Are you with me? If we settle, we die. Look at your life and, and, and begin to reinvest in your life. Recognize that you can't take people to a place you've never been yourself. Recognize that you can't lead people with just words. You've got to lead them through exampleship. Come on, somebody. You, you can't tell people to have victory and you're always walking in defeat. You, you can't lead a, a generation if you're not that model of that generation. You, you can't you know, tell people to parent if you're not parenting well yourself. Pick up a book on parenting. Go to a parenting class. I, 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 you know, if you want to grow, you, 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 you want to grow up, you've got to show them. You've got to show up. You've, you've got to be willing to put yourself in a place, not of teaching, you've got to put yourself in a place of learning. Make yourself the greatest in, in, investment and do this. Watch this. Prepare for something greater. That's what the Bible says to do. Even in the promise God's given our ministry, he says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Another way that scripture is also spoken of, it says, build, build an addition. What am I saying to you this morning? You haven't arrived. Build an addition on your life. Make more room for learning. Make more room for impartation. Make more room to receive. If you want to grow, you've got to receive more. Can I hear an amen? amen? And here's what I want you to do as a leader. Put yourself under another leader who's winning in the area where you want to break through. Mm. Make yourself a student again. Put yourself in a Bible study, man. Go, go to a city life group. Plug in with a group of people. Watch this that are doing what you seek to do, that are experiencing what you seek to experience. If, if you say, I need more joy, get away from grumpy people. Get around joyful people. 
I mean, you want joy, you're in a group, everybody's grumpy, like, I got to get out this group. You want financial blessing, get around the people that are experiencing financial blessing. You want to learn to preach, stop listening to drive teaching and get around a preacher. Get around a person who moves in the Holy Spirit. You want to go to another level in prayer? Then link up with Pastor Victor and the prayer team and say, man, teach me to pray. The disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. Teach me to pray. I've got some mountains to move. i got some strongholds to cast down. Come on, somebody. If you're going to grow, put yourself under a leader that is doing what you want to do. And here's the third way to grow. Tackle some bigger things in your life. Do something bigger. And, then, and before you do it, pray bigger first. See, vision and dreams always begin in prayer. Always begin in the throne room of God. Can I hear an amen? Get down before God and say, God, expand my mind, expand my heart, expand my dream, expand my vision. I, in order to grow, Here's what you got to do, man. Watch this. Set some new goals for yourself. Because when you set new goals for yourself, life is no longer boring. It becomes exciting. Challenge yourself. Push yourself. Oh, man, I'm preaching. You're just looking at me. It's okay. It's all right. That's all right. It's all right. I don't, I don't want an amen from you. I just want someone to catch this. To just, 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 just challenge yourself, man. Just be like, oh, man. The things I've done in the past are nothing compared to the things that I'm about to do. The things I've seen in the past are nothing compared to the things that I'm about to see. I'm going to dream bigger. I'm going to pray bigger. I'm going to serve bigger. Come on, give God a praise. I'm almost done. Matthew, come on. This, this is why winners win. Because they know. Because they grow. And then lastly, and this is most importantly. And I, I want you to really catch it right now. Is they know they grow. And then thirdly, most importantly, they sow. They sow. Winners. Winners. Especially barrier breakers. Have something flowing out of their life. There's a river. That flows out of their life. See, people who are stuck. There's nothing flowing out. It's. It's like a dry creek. But when you break through one barrier and then you break through another barrier, there's substance in your life that's bigger than you. There's experience in your life that's bigger than you. There are words that you speak that are bigger than you. There's, there's stories that come out of you that are bigger than you. There are miracles that you've experienced. Watch this that are bigger than you. And when you break barriers and you win, there's a river that flows out of you. You know, some people want ministry. They tell me all the time, Pastor, I want to do ministry. I think really what they want to do is preach. They don't really want to minister. There's a big difference between preaching and ministry. And I'll tell you what ministry is. Ministry is when you break through in your life and God gives you a river. And out of your life flows a river for other people to drink from. That's ministry. And every time you fight and you press and you break a barrier, you just get more water. <laughs> you just get more water. And that water becomes so abundant that you can't help but to sow. Let me show you the difference between two mentalities in this room right now. There are some of you, when I said to sow, I lost you. But there's some of you that said, Pastor Al, that should have been the first point. Because you understand that winners have something to give. They have something to give. Come on, clap for the Lord. Winners have something flowing out of their life. And I think there's a winning spirit here. I, I know it. But, but we're called 
to know our purpose, to grow on our purpose, and then to take what we have and to sow it into others. Take what we have and to give it. Because any person who is winning in God recognizes that winning only comes by way of making a life that's beneficial to others. I've decided this. I've determined this in my heart. What does winning matter to me if those around me aren't winning? What does winning matter to me if you're not winning? Why do I stay fresh? Because you got to win. Why do I stay sharp? Because you got to win. Why is it that I have a fresh word every Sunday for you? Because I, 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 you got to win. <laughs> you got to win. You, I've, God's called me to help you win. And I know sometimes you don't like it. You say, I don't like what he said. Don't matter if you hear what God is saying to you. You're not going to lose. You're going to have the victory. You're going to have the breakthrough. You're going to win. Come on. It's taken some people a little bit of time to figure that out with me. I'm not in this for myself. I'm in this to see the people of God rise to new levels. But the times have changed. I'll tell your neighbor, times have changed. Because I'm not the only one. God's going to use you to help someone else win. Because he's put a river in you. And that water's got to flow. And the only way for that water to flow is you've got to sow. You've got to have a life that's beneficial to other people. You see, winners simply are givers. And we're going to receive the tithe and offering right now. And I just did it because I just felt it worked well with the message, but it's not a big deal. But here's the thing. Winners are givers. There are four great winning quotes. I'm not sure all happy people are generous, but I've never seen a generous person who wasn't happy. Givers are, are happy people. Takers are grumpy people. Nobody was never honored for what they received, but only for what they've given. Givers make history. He who waits to do a great deal at once will never do anything. He who waits to do a great deal at once will never do anything. Because conditions will never be perfect. And it doesn't take much to make a difference, meaning if you want to become a winner and be a giver, you can start today. Lastly, God will only give to us what he knows will flow through us. The measure you use is the measure you will receive. So what is this message about? It's about breaking through so that others can break through. It's about pressing through and making a way for people to have needs to receive what you have in your life already. So we got to know. We've got to grow. We've got to sow. Pastor Chris told me, Pastor, let the people know this is the last week to sign up for Family Life Hope. So you need to sign up. This is the last week. I'm going to be teaching tonight 50 new people in our first class. I'm excited about that. Position yourself. Position your life under the area where you want to learn how to win. Right now, I'm hanging out with business people like crazy. I'm hanging out with people who make a lot of money. And I'm just getting in there. And I'm, if I could ask them one question, that's my goal. Can you just, I want to, boom. And then they, and what do they do? They say, no, I'm not going to tell you. I don't know you. Who are you? They say, no, what a great question. And then what, what happens, they open their mouth and the river begins to flow. I put myself in a place where I want to grow and learn. If you want to grow, you got to put yourself in a place. Are you catching this? Where you want to learn. Come on, give God a praise. Give him a praise right now. That's the key. And then the river fills you. And then you take what he's put inside of you and you begin to let it pour out of you. One way that we want to do that this morning is through our financial giving. Now, if you need a tithing envelope, I want you to go ahead and lift your hand. And as you prepare your tithes, we know the tithe belongs to the Lord, right? I want to give you an update on where we're at with the pledges. First and foremost, I want to tell you 
how extremely proud I am of our church. Very proud of our church. Up to this point, I said, give me the report this morning. I said, how much has come in? They said, $120,000 has come in. That's awesome. $120,000 has come in. And the reason that has happened is because we have people that have made a decision to be generous. That recognize the purpose on the church and the purpose on their life. I think they also recognize the purpose on me and Georgina's life. They say, man, our pastors really have a vision. They're really committed to their vision, so we're going to get behind them with our giving. And I'm very proud of our church. Can we give God a praise for this? Many of the families have paid up on their pledge. Now, we have a little bit of a deficit here, but we don't want to take too much more time doing this. We need for you to decide today whether you're going to complete your pledge or not. Now, if you say, I'm not going to complete my pledge, um, then that's fine. You know, that's fine. But if you are going to do it and you said, oh, I, I had it in my heart to finish, Pastor. I can't believe I waited until the last minute. First and foremost, I'm not mad at you. Don't worry. I'm not mad at you. I love you. I love you. I love you. But, but just bring it in today. Give, give it all today. I can't drag this on anymore. Uh, bring it in. Turn it in. Pay it right now on the phone or whatever you have. Bite the bullet. Bite the bullet. And just pay it right now. Some pledge 2,500. Some pledge 1,500. 1,500. And, uh, you know, just go ahead and do that now. So we could just be done. Just be done and start moving towards our project. Now, you say, what's up with the project? Okay. We've been meeting with a lot of architects, and oh my God, it's giving me a headache. Come on. Gosh, it's a headache. We've gotten a real good education on a lot of things. Where the plan is headed right now is we're believing that we could probably, without li with limited complications with the city, push our seating back to 1,200 seats. How many think that will still be pretty good? 1,200 seats. But with that, we're also believing not only to push the 1,200 seats, to remodel the whole outside of the building, to beautify it, modernize this side of it, and then also remodel the whole inside of the sanctuary, and then buy another piece of land close by for property. How many think that would be all right? Amen. And so we'll be having a schematic drawing for you, uh, hopefully by September 1st. That's what we're looking for. Once we get that schematic drawing, then we can go to the city, get their approval, and go ahead and start looking at finding contractors and things like that to break ground. We're going to need every all the skilled workers, all the business owners, all the laborers to help us. But how many want to build the house of the Lord? Build the house of the Lord. It'll be a beautiful thing. And so right now, we just need the pledge to come in that you gave. Nothing too heavy. You owe 500, pay it today. You owe 200, pay it today. You owe 1,000, pay it today. Just pay it off today. Get done with it. Because what do we have to do next? Okay, I'll tell you right now what we got to do. Woo, it's been a busy summer. We got to win, run for hope. Okay. How many think we can win it? Okay. Well, we got to get to work on it. Now, I've been doing all I can, negotiating and making deals for you guys. I got that house for 10 years, thanks to Brother Louie. Let me thank God for Uncle Louie. He helped us with that. I got that deal. Got that done for you. Amen? We want to open up like a ministry training center. We got the women's home secure. Thank God Johnny at least been doing so great with the men's home. Amen. got that done. We're doing all this stuff, but all I need you to do is your part. How many can say amen? So this morning, I want to receive the tithes and the offering, and then I want to receive whatever remaining pledges that we have this morning so that we can start to close the door on the pledge. Amen? Now, if you're here and say, oh, I don't have it all today, Pastor, you put something on it. But we're going to officially go ahead and say, all right, but if you need a couple more weeks, then do that on your own conviction. Okay? Your own conviction. So I get paid and I get paid. 
Do that on your own conviction. That's between you and God now. The pledge is not mine anyways. It belongs to the Lord. So do that on your own conviction. Winners will fulfill a promise. I'm going to say amen. So do that on your own conviction. I'm not going to gas you up for it any longer. You won't hear anything about the pledge after this week. You'll start hearing about Run for Hope. Amen. <laughs> and we got to do some work on that one. But here's what I believe with all my heart. I believe that you're going into a new season. How many want to go into a new season? Do you want to do it? Well, then all we got to do is continue to be faithful in everything God has given us. Praise the Lord. How many of you have your tithe, your offering today? Can I see it? How many have a pledge today? Let me see a pledge. Any pledgers? Anyone with a pledge? Okay. Got a few. Good. Good. Let's let's begin to believe God for financial breakthrough. Go ahead and stand with me real quick. I want to pray for you. Pray for you. Did you receive the message this morning? I thought it was a good message. I feel it was pretty good because I believe it with all my heart. And what I want you to first, I want you to leave with today is I want you to know this. There's a future. Can you just look at your neighbor and encourage him and tell him there is a future. And you're, you're going to be not just in it, you're going to be leading in it. You're going to be leading in it. But we're in a season of preparation now. Praise the Lord. Just lift up your giving and just love him all over this place. Just love him all over this place. Oh, we thank you this morning. We thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Maybe the ushers can come stand up here. Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. Oh, we thank you for that word this morning. God, fill us. Fill us, God. Fill us right now. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Fill us, God. All over this place, all over this place. Lord, as we begin to plant our seed, begin to multiply it, God, you're looking for those that will grow and will sow and will know your plan. Father, you've given us a future. You've given us a hope, and we're going to sow into that future right now. So, Father, we love you. We praise you. We exalt you. We magnify you. Come on, and let me hear you talking to them, church. Talk to them. Come on, whatever you need right now, begin to ask the Lord to give it to you right now. Say, Lord, fill me with that river. Fill me with that river. Fill me with that river. If anybody be weak or sick in body, begin to fill them with your power, with the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus' name. Begin to heal bodies. Begin to restore. 